Well, this evening, uh, we're, as I've mentioned already, we're going to look just at uh, one verse from our text this morning. And that is verse 29, John chapter 8, verse 29, where we're given another one of those characteristics of virtues the Lord tells us particularly pleasing to him, and that is the disposition to please him in everything that we do. Uh, that's what we see in our Lord Jesus Christ. He says to those Jews that he was um, speaking to, as we read in our text this morning, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Now remember that Jesus is our example. We are to follow in his footsteps, and this is what he did. Always those things that are pleasing to the Father. Now, I would suspect that we don't often think about that and do that. We do, I'm sure we do most of the time, uh, you know, that we, we think about those things, but we need to be doing this all the time if we are to know the Lord's presence and his blessing. Now, let me just mention again by, by way of um, review that this morning we saw that Jesus said his father sent him to preach or to bring the gospel into the world to the Jews to reveal his love to reveal his grace, to reveal his mercy to sinners. Now we might think, well, that, that's a relatively easy thing for one who is God and man to do. But we do need to remember that Jesus, though he is a divine person, had a human body and a human soul. He was fully man, and in this world he lived fully as a man. This was a rather large task uh, beyond the ability of any mortal man to do. And so to do this, Jesus needed something. He needed his father to be with him, and his father was with him. He wasn't left to do this by himself. The father said he would be with him to bless him and to strengthen him. This was Jesus' assurance that he would be able to complete the work that his father sent him into the world to do. But the question is, why was the Father with him? Why would he be with him? Well, obviously because he's a son. Obviously because the Father sent him into the world to do this work and he wouldn't leave him alone. But it's also true that he would be with him because of the way he actually went about doing this work. Because of the way he lived. Because he devoted himself to his Father. Jesus says in our text, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And I think that comes out quite clearly in his baptism when the father says in Matthew 3.17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, Jesus at that time, I think we assume, was around 30 years of age. And so for those 30 years he had lived, and those are the roughest 30 years I suppose you might say of one's life, but in those 30 years, he lived in a way that was pleasing to his father. And so his father was with him. Now tonight, I want us to consider that the Lord will also be with us. To bless us and to strengthen us. To do what he's made us to do and what he has called us to do. If we will devote ourselves to him as our Lord Jesus Christ did. Because this is the kind of person that God delights to bless. Now we do need to understand that the Father has a disposition to bless us. That's what he wants to do. He wants to be with us and he wants to help us in the things that he's called us to do. But there are certain things that we can do or not do that get in the way of his blessing. Now one of those is when we do not believe him, when we do not trust him. James tells us in James 1, verses 5 through 8, But if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable 
in all his ways. A lack of faith, a lack of trust, a lack of believing that God is true to his word can stifle God's help, his presence, and his blessing with us. But another thing that can get in the way of his blessing, uh, his blessing in our lives is the way that we live. You know, when we allow ourselves to do things that God does not want us to do, or when we can't bring ourselves to do the things he commands us to do. You know, the question, again, we're asking as we're going through the series is, is this, does obedience really matter? Does it really make a difference? I mean, won't he just simply bless us because we've trusted in his son? Isn't that all we need to do? Well, it isn't everything we need to do. Yes, he will bless us if we've trusted in his son. Yes, he will give us salvation. That comes purely by grace through faith alone. But the degree to which we are blessed here depends on how we live here. The degree to which we'll be rewarded in heaven depends on how we live here on earth, how we live for the Lord or not for the Lord. Now, there are numerous examples in Scripture of the Lord singling out specific individuals as being particularly important or precious to Him. And here's, here's an example from Ezekiel 14, verses 13 through 21. And you tell me as I read this whether or not the Lord is singling out particular individuals as being praiseworthy in His sight. He says, Son of man, if a country sins against me by committing unfaithfulness and I stretch out my hand against it, destroy its supply of bread, send famine against it, and cut off from it both man and beast, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, by their own righteousness they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord God. If I were to cause wild beasts to pass through the land and they depopulated it, and it became desolate so that no one would pass through it because of the beasts. Though these three men were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either their sons or their daughters. They alone would be delivered, but the country would be desolate. Or if I should bring a sword on that country and say, let the sword pass through the country and cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either their sons or their daughters, but they alone would be delivered. Or if I should send a plague against that country and pour out my wrath in blood on it to cut off man and beast from it, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in its midst, as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either their sons or their, or either their son or their daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. For thus says the Lord God, how much more when I send my four severe judgments against Jerusalem, sword famine, wild beast, and plague to cut off man and beast from it. Now, did you notice anything that uh, seemed to be a recurring theme through this passage? It was the fact that there were three individuals that the Lord said were righteous men. And if they were among all these other people, God would deliver them, but he would not deliver the others. There was something special about these three men that made them particularly precious to God. But what was it that set them apart? I don't even think I need to, to say as we read those names, we're all very familiar with them, aren't we? They were men of faith. They were men who trusted God, believed his word. They were men who walked with God. And everything that they sought to do, they sought to do to please him, no matter what the cost. Now, in our passage, Jesus said the reason the Father was with him was because he always did the things that were pleasing to him. Now this evening, I just want us to consider that that's what we need to do if we are to experience God's presence and God's blessing. So let's just consider three things. What, is it, you know, what it means to please him, how often we should be trying to please him, and what the incentive is that God offers for pleasing him. So first of all, what does it mean to please the Lord? Well, it simply means 
to make choices that honor him. That when you make choices, you choose to do what it is you know God wants you to do rather than what you want to do. Make choices that you know are pleasing to him rather than choices that simply please you. Again, Jesus says in verse 29, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Now, one thing we need to recognize is whenever we make a choice, we always choose what we want. None of us ever chooses against our will. We choose what is pleasing to us. Now, ideally, that should be what God wants, what he wants us to choose. And it will be if our hearts are filled with the Spirit of God. But it likely won't be if, if they aren't. Now, sometimes we forget, even if we have God's Spirit, even if we are trusting in the Lord, that this is what we're supposed to be doing. We are not here to please ourselves. We're not here to live for ourselves. We are not here to make choices that are purely for our own pleasure. We are here to make choices that please Him. When we make choices that are purely for us, then we're basically living like the world because that's the way the world does it all the time. The world simply chooses what is pleasing to them at all times. They choose as though there's nobody else that's really in consideration but themselves and maybe those they care about. They are making choices as though God doesn't exist. We see if we make choices purely for our own pleasure, we're basically doing the same thing. We are making choices as though God doesn't exist. He needs to be in every choice we make. We're making choices as though we're not under the obligation to serve him or to please him in the things we do. Some people characterize this or some Christians have characterized this as living like atheists. Not theoretical atheists where we, we ever begin to think that God doesn't exist, but practical atheists where we make choices without God in the picture, without thinking about how our choices are actually going to impact him, whether he approves of them or doesn't approve of them. And I think, I really, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking none of us here really want to live at all like atheists. And if we don't, we need to make choices remembering that whatever we choose to do is either pleasing or displeasing to God. And that includes every single choice we make. Now, how do we know the difference? I mean, how do we know what's pleasing to him? How do we know what isn't pleasing to him? Well, the answer to that, of course, is obvious. God has given us a book called the Bible, a manual on how to please him, how to serve him, how to honor him. In this book, he tells us everything that we need to know. Paul writes to Timothy in a very familiar passage, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God. It's God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, the woman of God, the child of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. God has given to us everything we need to know in the scripture. But of course, that book isn't going to do us any good unless we read it, unless we study it. God has given to us teachers to explain to us what it means, to help us understand it, but they won't do us any good unless we listen to what it is they're saying. And even reading, studying, and listening to teachers isn't going to help us unless we actually take what we apprehend to be God's word, what we understand to be his will and what is pleasing to him, and actually do what it says unless we let it actually direct us in the choices that we make. You know, it's been said that we all know a lot more than we do. I mean, a lot more than, than we practice. We all know more about God's will than what we actually practice in our lives. This calls us to bring a balance between our knowledge and our practice. We need to do what we know God wants us to do. That is how you please the Lord. 
Now, the second question is, how often should you please the Lord? And I think the answer to that is obvious as well. We, we ask the question, well, how often did Jesus uh, do what was pleasing to his Father? Well, he says again in our passage in verse 29, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Uh, Jesus never took a break from being a Christian. He always did what was pleasing to the Father all the time. We read in our meditation in John 4, 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He would rather please the Father than, than eat, than take care even of his necessary, you know, his necessities, his needs. And we need to ask ourselves the question, is that the way we are? Is that what you do? Is that more important to you than your necessary food? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We need to seek his glory in everything, which means at all times. Now, one problem we often face, especially as new Christians, is how do we integrate Christianity fully into our lives? How do we become full-time Christians in everything we do, in every situation? Most professing Christians today are only Christians part-time. That's just the way it seems to work out. Maybe on Sundays and Wednesday evenings. Maybe only on Sunday. Maybe only during the worship service on Sunday. But what about the rest of the time? Well, they live pretty much like everyone else in the world. They make similar choices, thinking only about those things they want to do to please themselves. Now, usually, those who profess faith in Christ aren't as, as bad as unbelievers. I think every profession or every generation of professing Christians, it has, again, I think generally acknowledged, tends to live about 20 years behind how the people around them are living. They're behind the world by about one generation. But God's ethics never change. His standard is always the same. It is timeless. And he calls every generation of Christians to live according to his standards. And his standard is that in every choice we make, we need to make it to be pleasing to him all the time in every area. We need to make choices of what we are going to think about. And yes, what we think about is certainly a choice. We can choose either to dwell on thoughts that are sinful or put them out of our minds and think about what is right. What we choose to desire, is, that's also a choice. We think maybe sometimes it isn't because you know, we're struggling with our flesh, but there, it is a choice and we're held responsible for it. <clears throat> Even the sinful things that we desire our choices, and all of us have those struggles we have to make, or that we, that we, those struggles that we have to go through. We all have at least one besetting sin, if not more, but we have a choice whether or not to resist those desires in our hearts, whether to leave them uncontested, or to fight against them and put them to death. The Lord says that we need to choose to fight against them, if we are to please Him, if what we desire is not what God wants us to have, or if we find ourselves struggling to do what we know He wants us to do, our desires are choices once the Lord turns the lights on, once He gives us His grace, we can choose to go one direction or another. We need to make choices to please Him in what we choose to say. Our words are certainly choices. And we know about the difficulty of taming the tongue, but we do need to tame the tongue if we are going to be pleasing to him. And, of course, what we choose to do. These are all choices. We need to let God's word shape those choices so that all of them, in the things we think about, desire, say, and do, they all need to be pleasing to him all the time. Now, just to tie this in with something we saw recently, this is what Stuart Olliott was, was referring to when he says we need to yield to the Spirit of God. 
as we read and we study the Bible, and again, let's not forget that that, that is essentially what we are doing when we, when we pick up the Bible and study it, when we read it, when we read commentaries, when we go through systematic theologies, when we read the sermons that have been printed or listen to sermons, these are only so many tools to help us understand the Bible. And as we study the Bible, as we set our hearts to please God, the Spirit of God, if we are in the Word, will bring the passage of Scripture to our minds that applies to that situation and will give us the desire to do what God tells us to do. And we need to yield to that and not to what our flesh wants us to do. We need to yield to the Spirit of God as He seeks to lead us in the way of God. And He's really the only one who can give us the ability to do this. So what does it mean to please the Lord? It means to make choices that are pleasing to Him. And when are we to do this? We are to do this all the time and not be just part-time Christians. Now finally, what incentive does the Lord offer to encourage us to make choices that will please Him? Well, He, he offers an incentive that for, for us, for Christians, is, is the ultimate blessing. God says He will be with us. Again, pointing to our text in John 8, verse 29, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Do you want God to be with you? Do you want him to bless you as we read in Psalm chapter 1, where everything you do will prosper? Do you want him to bless you? Do you want him to strengthen you in the things that you do for him? Well, this is how you do it. Now again, we recognize that, um, you know, thinking about the God being with us, thinking about His presence with us can sometimes be, oh, a little bit daunting because sometimes we may feel like we don't want to have God around so closely because we know we're doing things that He doesn't approve of. And that's true of all of us. All of us do things every day throughout the day that we know is not pleasing to God and would rather that God not see. You realize that God knows what you're thinking, He sees what you're desiring, He hears what you say, He sees what you do. None of us are perfect, not even for one moment. But we do need to realize that God does forgive us if we're willing to confess our sins, if we're willing to turn from our sins to Him. He is continually cleansing us from all of our sins because of what His Son did for us on the cross. And we need to understand, too, that God always sees those things. He always is aware of those things regardless of what we do. So we're not really talking about that. What we're talking about here is the presence of His Spirit. He is the one who is the presence of God with us. He is the one whom Jesus sent into the world to comfort you and to strengthen you and to help you in everything that you do for Him. He is the one who will be with you if you are intent on pleasing God. You can't really please God without Him. You need His ministry. The more you have of His ministry, the more you're going to be able to please Him, and the less you have, the less you'll be able to do this. So how can you have more? You can have more by making choices that please Him. Every time you make a choice that pleases the Spirit of God, His presence with you grows stronger. God's presence with you grows stronger. Your ability to do what is honoring to the Lord grows stronger. But every time you don't make choices that please the Lord, it grows weaker. We know that when we, we make sinful choices, we offend this Holy One who is with us. And He withdraws from us to some degree, thankfully, never completely and fully. But David was aware of this when he committed adultery and murder. He sensed the loss of something that was very precious to him, the loss of God's Holy Spirit. He says in Psalm 51, verses 11 and 12, 
Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Notice when we sin and we grieve and quench the Spirit of God and He withdraws, we lose two things that are very precious. We lose the joy of His salvation, which is, I think, something of the assurance that we have that we belong to Him. And we also lose our willingness to serve the Lord. We grow spiritually weaker. We only have this joy and assurance. We only have this willingness because of the presence of God, because of His Holy Spirit. But the loss of it brings the loss of these things, really that which is precious to us as believers. And so you need to ask yourself this question. Do you want that joy? Do you want to be the kind of person who is set and intent on serving God. If you do, then you have to make choices, choices that honor Him. Choose the things that He loves. And don't choose the things that He hates. I mean, it's a no-brainer, but I'm just simply saying that that is what we have to do consciously all the time in all of our choices. The more you try to please Him, the more He will be with you. The more power you will have to serve Him the more power you will have in prayer, the more you will sense his, his protection over your life, and the stronger will be your assurance that you belong to Him. Now, He's given to us everything that we need. He's given to us His Spirit. He's given to us His Word. The only thing we need to do is set our hearts to do this and stop excusing ourselves for not doing it. You ever found yourself doing that? Well, I didn't do this because of this, this, and this. There are no excuses for failing to make the right choices. There's no excuse for sin. And we need to believe that. We need to accept it. And we need to purpose to put all sin off. Now, it's interesting that um, you know how the Lord providentially works. I was looking over the, uh, the materials we're going to be looking at uh, as we study revival on, um, you know, on Wednesday evenings and it happened to land on this particular quote by Spurgeon which I'd like to read for you now and it is an encouragement to be meticulous in putting away all of our sins which are choices to do the wrong thing and to make all right choices. Spurgeon writes this, is there any lust in me? Do I indulge the flesh? Am I fond of carnal indulgences by which my soul suffers? If so, God will not walk with me. For chambering, wantonness, gluttony, and drunkenness separate between a believer and his God. These things are not convenient to a Christian. Before the great feast of unleavened bread, a Jewish parent would sweep out every piece of leaven from his house. So anxious would he be and so anxious is the Jew at the present day that he takes a candle and sweeps out every cupboard. No matter though there may have been no food put in there at any time, he is afraid lest by accident a crumb may be somewhere concealed in the house. So from the garret to the cellar he clears the whole house through to purge out the old leaven. Let us do so. We need to get rid of all sin and make no excuse for it. Make good choices and not bad. The choices we know that are pleasing to Him. Everything you want to be and do as a Christian is wrapped up in God's presence with you. And so seek to please Him. Try to please Him in everything. In everything you think, everything you desire, everything you say, and everything you do at all times. And the Lord will be with you, and he will bless you. May the Lord help us to receive that encouragement this evening to make the choices that we know are pleasing to him. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.